Chapter 21 Wounds of the Present When dawn arrived, Roran woke and lay staring at the whitewashed ceiling while he listened to the slow rasp of his own breathing. After a minute, he rolled off the bed, dressed, and proceeded to the kitchen, where he procured a chunk of bread, smeared it with soft cheese, then stepped outside onto the front porch to eat and admire the sunrise. His tranquility was soon disrupted when a herd of unruly children dashed through the garden of a nearby house, shrieking with delight at their game of catch the cat, followed by a number of ad adults intent on snaring their respective charges. Roran watched the cacophonous parade vanish around a corner, then placed the last of the bread in his mouth and returned to the kitchen, which had filled with the rest of the household. Elaine greeted him. Good morning, Roran. She pushed open the wood window shutters and gazed up at the sky. It looks like it may rain again. The more the better, asserted Horst. It'll help keep us hidden while we climb Narnmore Mountain. Us? inquired Roran. He sat at the table beside Albrick, who was rubbing the sleep from his eyes. Horst nodded. Sloan was right about the food and supplies. We have to help carry them up the falls, or else there won't be enough. Will there still be men to defend Carvajal? Of course, of course. Once they had all had breakfast, Roran helped Baldor and Albrecht wrap spare food, blankets, and supplies into three large bundles that they slung across their shoulders and hauled to the north end of the village. Roran's calf pained him, but not unbearably. Along the way, they met the three brothers Darman, Larn, and Hammond, who were similarly burdened. Just inside the trench that circumnavigated the houses, Roran and his companions found a large gathering of children, parents, and grandparents, all busy organizing for the expedition. Several families had volunteered their donkeys to carry goods and the younger children. The animals were picketed in an impatient, braying line that added to the overall confusion. Roran set his bundle on the ground and scanned the group. He saw Svart, Igor's uncle, and at nearly sixty, the oldest man at Carvajal, seated on a bale of clothes, teasing a baby with the tip of his long white beard. Noel Favrel, who was guarded over by Bridget, Felda, Nola, Kalitha, and a number of other mothers with worried expressions, and a great many reluctant people, both men and women. Roran also saw Katrina among the crowd. She glanced up from a knot she was tying on a pack and smiled at him, then returned to her task. Since no one seemed to be in charge, Roran did his best to sort out the chaos by overseeing the arranging and packing of the various supplies. He discovered a shortage of water skins, but when he asked for more, he ended up with thirteen too many. Delays such as those consumed the early morning hours. In the middle of discussing with Loring the possible need for extra shoes, Roran stopped as he noticed Sloan standing at the entrance to an alleyway. The butcher surveyed the massive activity before him. Contempt cut into the lines along his downturned face. His sneer hardened into enraged incredulity as he spotted Katrina who had shouldered her pack, removing any possibility that she was there only to help. A vein throbbed down the middle of Sloane's forehead. Roran hurried toward Katrina, but Sloane reached her first. He grabbed the top of the pack and shook it violently, shouting, Who made you do this? Katrina said something about the children and tried to pull free, but Sloane yanked at the pack, twisting her arms as the straps slid off her shoulders and threw it on the ground so that the contents scattered. Still shouting, Sloane grabbed Katrina's arm and began to drag her away. She dug in her heels and fought, her copper hair swirling over her face like a dust storm. Furious, Roran threw himself at Sloane and tore him from Katrina, shoving the butcher in the chest so that he stumbled backwards several yards. Stop! I'm the one who wanted her to go. Sloane glared at Roran and snarled, You have no right. I have every right. Roran looked at the ring of spectators who had gathered around and then declared so all could hear. Katrina and I are engaged to be married, and I would not have my future wife treated so. For the first time that day, the villagers fell completely silent. Even the donkeys were quiet. Surprise and a deep, inconsolable pain sprang onto Sloane's vulnerable face, along with the glimmer of tears. For a moment, Roran felt sympathy for him. Then a series of contortions distorted Sloane's visage, each more extreme than the last, until his skin turned beet red. He cursed and said, 
You two-faced coward. How could you look me in the eye and speak to me like an honest man, while at the same time courting my daughter without permission? I dealt with you in good faith, and here I find you plundering my house while my back is turned. I had hoped to do this properly, said Rorn, but events have conspired against me. It was never my intention to cause you grief. Even though this hasn't gone the way either of us wanted, I still want your blessing, if you are willing. I would rather have a maggot-riddled pig for a son than you. You have no farm, you have no family, and you will have naught to do with my daughter. The butcher cursed again, and she'll have naught to do with the spine. Sloane reached for Katrina, but Roran blocked the way, his face as hard as his clenched fists. Only a hand's breadth apart, they stared directly at each other, trembling from the strength of their emotions. Sloane's red-rimmed eyes shone with manic intensity. Katrina, come here, Sloane commanded. Roran withdrew from Sloane, so that the three of them formed a triangle and looked at Katrina. Tears streamed down her face as she glanced between him and her father. She stepped forward, hesitated, then with a long, anguished cry, tore at her hair in a frenzy of indecision. Katrina! exclaimed Sloane with a burr of fear. Katrina, murmured Warren. At the sound of his voice, Katrina's tears ceased, and she stood straight and tall with a calm expression. She said, I'm sorry, father, but I have decided to marry Roran, and stepped to his side. Sloane turned bone white. He bit his lips so hard that a bead of ruby blood appeared. You can't leave me. You're my daughter. He lunged at her with crooked hands. In that instant, Roran bellowed and struck the butcher with all his strength, knocking him sprawling in the dirt before the entire village. Sloane rose slowly, his face and neck flushed with humiliation. When he saw Katrina again, the butcher seemed to crumple inward, losing height and stature, until Roran felt as if he were looking at a specter of the original man. In a low whisper, he said, It is always so. Those closest to the heart cause the most pain. Thou will have no dowry from me, snake, nor your mother's inheritance. Weeping bitterly, Sloane turned and fled toward his shop. Katrina leaned against Roran, and he put an arm around her. Together they clung to each other as people crowded against them, offering condolences, advice, congratulations, and disapproval. Despite the commotion, Roran was aware of, no aware of nothing but the woman whom he held, and who held him. Just then, Elaine bustled up as fast as her pregnancy would allow. "'Oh, you poor dear!' she cried, and embraced Katrina, drawing her from Roran's arms. "'Is it true you are engaged?' Katrina nodded and smiled then erupted into hysterical tears against Elaine's shoulder. "'There now, there now!' Elaine cradled Katrina gently, petting her and trying to soothe her, but without avail. Every time Warren thought she was about to recover, Katrina began to cr cry again with renewed intensity. Finally, Elaine peered over Katrina's quaking shoulder and said, "'I'm taking her back to the house.' "'I'll come.' "'No, you won't,' retorted Elaine." She needs time to calm down, and you have work to do. Do you want my advice? Roran nodded dumbly. Stay away until evening. I guarantee she will be right as rain by then. She can join the others tomorrow. Without waiting for his response, Elaine escorted the sobbing Katrina away from the wall of sharpened trees. Roran stood with his hands hanging limply by his sides, feeling dazed and helpless. What have we done? He regretted that he had not revealed their engagement to Sloane sooner. He re regretted that he and Sloane could not work together to shield Katrina from the Empire. And he regretted that Katrina had been forced to relinquish her only family for him. He was now doubly responsible for her welfare. They had no choice but to get married. I've made a terrible mess of this. He sighed and clenched his fist, wincing as his blue bruised knuckles stretched. How are you? asked Baldur, coming alongside him. Roran forced a smile. It didn't turn out quite how I'd hoped. Sloane's beyond reason when it comes to the spine. And Katrina. That too, I... Roran fell silent as Loring stopped before them. That was a blasted fool thing to do, growled the shoemaker, wrinkling his nose. Then he stuck out his chin, grinned, and bared his stumps of teeth. But I hope you and the girl have the best of luck. He shook his head. 
Heh, you're gonna need it, Stronghammer. We're all gonna need it, snapped Thane as he walked past. Loring waved a hand. Bah, sourpuss. Listen, Roran, I've lived in Carvajal for many, many years, and in my experience, it's better that this happened now, instead of when we're all warm and cozy. Baldor nodded, but Roran asked, Why so? Isn't it obvious? Normally, you and Katrina would be the meat of gossip for the next nine months. Loring put a finger on the side of his nose. Ah, but this way, you'll soon be forgotten amid everything else that's going on, and then the two of you might even have some peace. Roran frowned. I'd rather be talked about than have those desecrators camped on the road. So would we all. Still, it's something to be grateful for. And we all need something to be grateful for. Especially once you're married. Loring cackled and pointed at Roran. Your face just turned purple, boy. Roran grunted and set about gathering Katrina's possessions off the ground. As he did, he was interrupted by comments from whoever happened to be nearby, none of which helped to settle his nerves. Rocket, he muttered to himself after a particular, particularly invidious remark. Although the expedition to the spine was delayed by the unusual scene the villagers had just witnessed, it was only slightly after mid-morning when the caravan of people and donkeys began to ascend the bear trail, scratched into the side of Narnmore Mountain to the crest of the Igualda Falls. It was a steep climb and had to be taken slowly, on account of the children and the size of the burdens everyone carried. Roran spent most of his time caught behind Kalitha, Thane's wife, and her five children. He did not mind, as it gave him an opportunity to indulge his injured calf and to consider recent events at length. He was disturbed by his confrontation with Sloan. At least, he consoled himself, Katrina won't remain in Carvajal much longer. For Roran was convinced, in his heart of hearts, that the village would soon be defeated. It was a sobering, yet unavoidable, realization. He paused to rest three-quarters of the way up the mountain and leaned against the tree as he admired the elevated view of Palancar Valley. He tried to spot the Razak's camp, which he knew was just to the left of the Enora River and the road south, but was unable to discern even a wisp of smoke. Roran heard the roar of the Igualda Falls long before they came into sight. The falls appeared for all the world like a great snowy mane that billowed and drifted off Narnmore's craggy head to the valley floor a half mile below. The massive stream curved in several directions as it fell, the result of different layers of wind. Past the slate ledge where the Enora River became airborne, down a glen filled with thimbleberries, and then finally into a large clearing guarded on one side by a pile of boulders, Warren found those at the head of the procession had already begun setting up camp. The forest rang with the children's shouts and cries. Removing his pack, Roran untied an axe from the top, and set about clearing the underbrush from the site along with several other men. When they finished, they began chopping down enough trees to encircle the camp. The aroma of pine sap filled the air. Roran worked quickly, the wood chips flying in unison with his rhythmic swings. By the time the fortifications were complete, the camp had already been erected with seventeen wool tents, four small cook fires, and glum expressions from people and donkeys alike. No one wanted to leave, and no one wanted to stay. Roran surveyed the assortment of boys and old men clutching spears and thought, Too much experience and too little. The grandfathers know how to deal, deal with bears and the like, but will the grandsons have the strength to actually do it? Then he noticed the hard glint in the women's eyes and realized that while they might hold a babe or be busy tending a scraped arm, their own shields and spears were never far from reach. Roran smiled. Perhaps, perhaps we still have hope. He saw Nolfavrel sitting alone on a log, staring back toward Palancar Valley, then joined the boy, who looked at him seriously. Are you leaving soon? asked Nolfavrel. Roran nodded, impressed by his poise and determination. You will do your best, won't you, to kill the Razak and avenge my father? I would do it, except that Mama says I must guard my brothers and sisters. I'll bring you their heads myself, if I can promised Roran. The boy's chin trembled. That is good. No, Favreau. Roran paused as he searched for the right words. You are the only one here, besides me, who has killed a man. It doesn't mean we are better or worse than anyone else, but it means I can trust you to fight well if you are attacked. When Katrina comes here tomorrow, 
Will you make sure she's well protected? No Favreau's chest swelled with pride. I'll guard her wherever she goes. Then he looked regretful. That is, when I don't have to look after... Roran understood. Oh, your family comes first. But maybe Katrina can stay in the tent with your brothers and sisters. Yes, said Milfavrel slowly. Yes, I think that would work. You can rely on me. Thank you. Roran clapped him on the shoulder. He could have asked an older and more capable person. But the adults were too busy with their own responsibilities to defend Katrina as he hoped. Milfavrel, however would have the opportunity and inclination to assure that she remained safe. You can hold my place while we are apart. Warren stood as Bridget approached. Eyeing him flatly, she said, Come, it is time. Then she hugged her son and continued toward the falls with Roran and the other villagers, who were returning to Carvajal. Behind them, everyone in the small camp clustered around the felled trees and stared forlornly out through their wooden bars. As Roran proceeded about his work throughout the rest of the day, he felt Carvajal's emptiness deep inside. It was as if a part of himself had been extracted and hidden in the spine. And with the children gone, the village now felt like an armed camp. The change seemed to have made everyone grim and grave. When the fun sun finally sank into the waiting teeth of the spine, Roran climbed the hill to Horse's house. He stopped before the front door and placed a hand on the knob but remained there, unable to enter. Why does this frighten me as much as fighting? In the end, he forsook the front door entirely and went to the side of the house, where he slipped into the kitchen, and, to his dismay, saw Elaine sitting on one side, knitting, speaking to Katrina, who was opposite her. They both turned toward him, and Roran blurted, Are, are you all right? Katrina came to his side. I'm fine. She smiled softly. It was just a terrible shock when father... When... She ducked her head for a moment. Elaine has been wonderfully kind to me. She agreed to lend me Baldor's room for the night. I'm glad you are better, said Roran. He hugged her, trying to convey all of his love and adoration through that simple touch. Elaine wrapped up her knitting. Come now. The sun has set, and it's time you are off to bed, Katrina. Roran reluctantly let go of Katrina who kissed him on the cheek and said, I'll see you in the morning. He started to follow her out, but stopped when Elaine said with a barbed tone, Roran. Her delicate face was hard and stern. Yes? Elaine waited until they heard the creak of stairs that indicated Katrina was out of earshot. I hope you meant every promise you gave that girl, because if you didn't, I'll call an assembly and have you exiled within a week. Roran was dumbfounded. Of course I meant them. I love her. Katrina just sur surrendered everything she owned or cared about for you. Elaine stared up at him with unwavering eyes. I've seen men who throw their affections at young maids, like grain tossed at chickens. The maids sigh and weep and believe that they are special. Yet for the man, it's only a trifling amusement. You have always been honorable, Roran, but one's loins can turn even the most sensible person into a prancing booby or a sly, wicked fox. Are you one? For Katrina requires neither a fool, nor a trickster, nor even love. What she requires above all else is a man who will provide for her. If you abandon her, she will be the meanest person in Carvajal, forced to live off her friends, our first and only beggar. By the blood in my veins, I won't let that happen. Nor would I, protested Warren. I would have to be heartless, or worse, to do so. Elaine jerked her chin. Exactly. Don't forget that you intend to marry a woman who has lost both her dowry and her mother's inheritance. Do you understand what it means for Katrina to lose her inheritance? She has no silver, no linens, no lace, nor any of the things needed for a well-run home. Such items are all we own, passed from mother to daughter since the day we first settled Allegasia. They determine our worth. A woman without her inheritance is like... is like... is like a man without a farm or a trade said Roran. Just so. It was cruel of Sloan to deny Katrina her inheritance, but that can't be helped now. Both you and she have no money or resources. Life is difficult enough without that added hardship. You'll be starting from nothing and with nothing. Does the prospect frighten you or seem unbearable? So I ask you again, and don't lie, or the two of you will regret it for the rest of your lives. 
Will you care for her without grudge or resentment? Yes. Elaine sighed and filled two earthen cups with cider from a jug hanging among the rafters. She handed one to Roran as she seated herself back at the table. Then I suggest you devote yourself to replacing Katrina's home and inheritance, so that she and any daughters you may have can stand without shame among the wives of Carvajal. Roran sipped the cool cider. If we live that long. I. She brushed back a strand of her blonde hair and shook her head. You've chosen a hard path, Roran. I had to make sure that Katrina would leave Carvajal. Elaine lifted an eyebrow. So that was it. Well, I won't argue about it. But why on earth didn't you speak to Sloane about your engagement before this morning? When Horst asked my father, he gave our family twelve sheep, a sow, and eight pairs of iron wrought candlesticks before he even knew if my parents would agree. That's how it should be done. Surely you could have thought of a better strategy than striking your father-in-law to be. A painful laugh escaped Roran. I could have, but it never seemed the right time with all the res attacks. The Razak haven't attacked now for almost six days. He scowled. No, but it was... Oh, I don't know. He banged his fist on the table with frustration. Elaine put down her cup and wrapped her tiny hands around his. If you can mend this rift between you and Sloane now, before years of resentment accumulate... Your life with Katrina will be much, much easier. Tomorrow morning you should go to his house and beg his forgiveness. I won't beg. Not to him. Roran, listen to me. It's worth a month of begging to have peace in your family. I know from experience. Strife does not but make you miserable. Sloane hates the spine. He'll have nothing to do with me. You have to try, though, said her Elaine earnestly. Even if he spurns your apology... At least you can't be blamed for not making the effort. If you love Katrina, then swallow your pride and do what's right for her. Don't make her suffer for your mistake. She finished her cider, used a tin hat to snuff the candles, and left Roran sitting alone in the dark. Several minutes elapsed before Roran could bring himself to stir. He stretched out an arm and traced along the counter's edge until he felt the doorway, then proceeded upstairs all the while running the tips of his fingers over the carved walls to keep his balance. In his room, he disrobed and threw himself lengthwise on the bed. Wrapping his arms around his wool-stuffed pillow, Roran listened to the faint sounds that drifted through the house at night, the scrabble of a mouse in the attic and its intermittent squeaks, the groan of wood beams cooling in the night, the whisper and caress of wind at the lintel of his window, and, and the rustle of slippers in the hall outside his room. He watched as the latch above the doorknob was pulled free of its hook. Then the door inched forward with a rasp of protest. It paused. A dark form slipped inside. The door closed. And Warren felt a curtain of hair brush his face along with lips like rose petals. He sighed. Katrina. A thunderclap tore Warren from sleep. Light flared on his face as he struggled to regain awareness, like a diver desperate to reach the surface. He opened his eyes and saw a jagged hole blasted through his door. Six soldiers rushed through the yawning cleft, followed by the two Razak, who seemed to fill the room with their ghastly presence. A sword was pressed against Roran's neck. Beside him, Katrina screamed and pulled the blankets around her. Up, ordered the Razak. Roran cautiously got to his feet. His heart felt like it was about to explode in his chest. Tie his hands and bring him. As a soldier approached Roran with rope, Katrina screamed again and jumped on the men, biting and clawing furiously. Her sharp nails furrowed their faces, drawing streams of blood that blinded the cursing soldiers. Roran dropped to one knee and grabbed his hammer from the floor, then planted his feet, swinging the hammer over his head and roaring like a bear. The soldiers threw themselves at him in an attempt to subdue him through sheer numbers, but to no avail. Katrina was in danger, and he was invincible. Shields crumpled beneath his blows, brigadines and mail split under his merciless weapon, and hel helmets caved in. Two men were wounded, and three fell to rise no more. The clang and clamor had ra roused the household. Roran dimly heard Horst and his sons shouting in the hall. The Razak hissed to one another, then scuttled forward and grasped Katrina with inhuman strength, lifting her off the floor as they fled the room. Roran! 
she shrieked. Summoning his energy, Roran bowled past the two remaining men. He stumbled into the hall and saw the Razak climbing out a window. Roran dashed toward them and struck the, at the last Razak, just as it was about to descend below the windowsill. Jerking upright, the Razak caught Roran's wrist in midair and chittered with delight, blowing its fit fetid breath onto his face. Yes, you are the one we want. Roran tried to twist free, but the Razak did not budge. With his free hand, Roran buffeted the creature's head and shoulders, which were as hard as iron. Desperate and enraged, he seized the edge of the Razak's hood and wrenched it back, exposing his features. A hideous, tortured face screamed at him. The skin was shiny black, like a beetle of carapace. The head was bald. Each lidless eye was the size of his fist and gleamed like an orb of polished hematite. No iris or pupil existed. In place of a nose, mouth, and chin, a thick beak hooked to a sharp point that clacked over a barbed purple tongue. Roran yelled and jammed his heels against the side of the window frame, struggling to free himself from the monstrosity, but the Razak inexorably drew him out of the house. He could see Katrina on the ground, still screaming and fighting. Just as Roran's knees buckled, Horst appeared by his side and wrapped a knotted arm around his chest, locking him in place. "'Someone get a spear!' shouted the smith. He snarled, veins bulging on his neck from the strain of holding Roran. "'It'll take more than this demon spawn to best us!' The Razak gave a final yank, then, when it failed to dislodge Roran, cocked its head and said, "'You are ours!' It lunged forward with blinding speed, and Roran howled as he felt the Razak's beak close on his right shoulder, snipping through the front of the muscle. His wrist cracked at the same time. With a malicious cackle, the Razak released him and fell backward into the night. Horst and Roran sprawled against each other in the hallway. They have Katrina, groaned Roran. His vision flickered and went black around the edges as he pushed himself upright on his left arm. His right hung useless. Albrecht and Baldur emerged from his room, splattered with gore. Only corpses remained behind them. Now I have killed eight. Roran retrieved his hammer and staggered down the hall, finding his way blocked by Elaine and her white sleeping shift. She looked at him with wide eyes, then took his arm and pushed him down onto a wood chest set against the wall. You have to see Gertrude, but you'll pass out if this bleeding isn't stopped. He looked down at his right side. It was drenched in crimson. We have to rescue Katrina before, he clenched his teeth as the pain surged, before they do anything to her. He's right. We can't wait, said Horse, looming over them. Bind him up as best as you can, then we'll go. Elaine pursed her lips and hurried to the linen closet. She returned with several rags, which she wrapped tightly around Roran's torn, torn shoulder and his fractured wrist. Meanwhile, Albrick and Baldor scavenged armor and swords from the shoulder soldiers. Horse contented himself with just a spear. Elaine put her hands on Horse's chest and said, Be careful. She looked at her sons. All of you. We'll be fine, mother, promised Albrecht. She forced a smile and kissed them on the cheek. They left the house and ran to the edge of Carvajal, where they found that the wall of trees had been pulled open and the watchman, Baird, slain. Baldor knelt and examined the body, then said with a choked voice, He was stabbed from behind. Warren barely, barely heard him through the pounding in his ears. Dizzy. He leaned against the house and panted for breath. Ho! Oh, who goes? From their stations along Carvajal's perimeter, the other watchmen congregated around their murdered compatriot, forming a huddle of shuttered lanterns. In hushed tones, Horst described the attack in Katrina's plight. Who will help us? he asked. After a quick discussion, five men agreed to accompany them. The rest would remain to guard the breach in the wall and rouse the villagers. Pushing himself off the house, Warren trotted to the head of the group as it slipped through the fields and down the valley toward the Razak's camp. Every step was agony, yet it did not matter. Nothing mattered except Katrina. He stumbled once, and Horst wordlessly caught him. Half a mile from Carvajal, Ivor spotted a sentry on a hillock, which compelled them to make a wide detour. A few hundred yards beyond, the ruddy glow of torches became visible. Roran raised his good arm to slow their advance. 
then began to dodge and crawl through the tangled grass, startling a jackrabbit. The men followed Warren's lead as he worked his way to the edge of a grove of cattails, where he stopped and parted the remaining curtain of stalks to observe the thirteen soldiers. Where is she? In contrast to when they had first arrived, the soldiers appeared sullen and haggard, their weapons nicked and their armor dented. Most of them wore bandages that were rusty with splotches of dried blood. The men were clumped together, facing the two Razak, both of whom were now hooded, across a low fire. One man was shouting, Over half of us killed by a bunch of inbred, cockle-brained wood rats that can't even tell a pike from a poleaxe, or find the point of a sword even if it's lodged in their gut, because you don't have half the sense my banner boy does. I don't care if Galbatorix himself licks your boots clean. We won't do a thing until we have a new commander. The men nodded. One who's human. Really? demanded the Razak softly. We've had enough taking orders from hunchbacks like you, with all your clicking and teapot whistling. Makes us sick. And I don't know what you did with Sardson, but if you stay another night, we'll put steel in you and find out if you bleed like us. You can leave the girl, though. She'll be... The man did not get a chance to continue, for the largest Razak jumped across the fire and landed on his shoulders like a giant crow. Screaming, the soldiers collapsed, un collapsed under the weight. He tried to draw his sword, but the Razak pecked twice at his neck with its hidden beak, and he was still. "'We have to fight that?' muttered Ivor beyond, behind Vorn. The soldiers remained frozen with shock as the two Razak lapped from the neck of the corpse. When the black creatures rose, they rubbed their knobby hands together as if they were washing, and said, Yes, we will go. Stay if you wish. Reinforcements are only days away. The Razak threw back their heads and began to shriek at the sky, the wail becoming increasingly shrill until it passed from hearing. Roran looked up as well. At first he saw nothing, but then a nameless terror gripped him, as two barbed shadows appeared high over the spine, eclipsing the stars. They advanced quickly, growing larger and larger until they obscured half the sky with their ominous presence. A foul wind rushed across the land, bringing with it a sulfurous miasma that made Warren cough and, gra and gag. The soldiers were likewise afflicted. Their curses echoed as they pressed sleeves and scarves over their noses. Above them, the shadows paused and then began to drift downward enclosing the camp in a dome of menacing darkness. The sickly torches flickered and threatened to extinguish themselves, yet they still provided sufficient light to reveal the two beasts descending among the tents. Their bodies were naked and hairless, like newborn mice, with leathery gray skin pulled tight across their corded chests and bellies. In form, they re resembled starved dogs, except that their hind legs bulged with enough muscle to crush a boulder. A narrow crest extended from the back of each of their attenuated heads, opposite a long, straight ebony beak made for spearing prey, and cold, bulbous eyes identical to the Razak's. From their shoulders and backs sprang huge wings that made the air moan under their weight. Flinging themselves to the ground, the soldiers cowered and hid their faces from the monsters. A terrible, alien intelligence emanated from the creatures, bespeaking of a race far older and more powerful than humans. Roran was suddenly afraid that his mission might fail. Behind him, Horst whispered to the men, urging them to hold their ground and remain hidden, else they would be slain. The Razak bowed to the beasts, then slipped into a tent and returned carrying Katrina, who was bound with ropes, and leading Sloane. The butcher walked freely. Roran stared, unable to comprehend how Sloane had been captured. His house and he isn't anywhere near Horst's. Then it struck him. He betrayed us, said Roran with wonder. His fist slowly tightened on his hammer as the true horror of the situation exploded within him. He killed Baird, and he betrayed us. Tears of rage streamed down his face. Roran, murmured Horst, crouching beside him. You can't attack now. They'd slaughter us. Roran, do you hear me? He heard but a whisper in the distance as he watched the smaller Razak jump onto one beast above the shoulders, then catch Katrina as the other Razak tossed her up. Sloane seemed upset and frightened now. He began arguing with the Razak, shaking his head and pointing at the ground. 
Finally, there was axe struck him across the mouth, knocking him unconscious. Mounting the second beast, with the butcher slung over his shoulder, the larger Razak declared, We will return once it is safe again. Kill the boy and your lives are forfeit. Then the steeds flexed their massive thighs and leapt into the sky, once again shadows upon the field of stars. No words or emotions were left to Roran. He was utterly destroyed. All that remained was to kill the soldiers. He stood and raised his hammer in preparation to charge, but as he stepped forward, his head throbbed in unison with his wounded shoulder. The ground vanished in a burst of light, and he toppled into oblivion.